Welcome to today's panel discussion. I'm really excited. So in honor of International Women's Day, I'm Jeff Schreifels, principal at Veritas Group, and I'm going to take a moment to welcome you and introduce our incredible panelists. I was last night I was thinking about this and I was going, I feel kind of weird, like, inter, you know, introducing everyone. Maybe I shouldn't even be a part of this. You know, it's International Women's Day. But then I was thinking, you know, for years and years and years, women have been introducing men and then stepping into the shadows. Today's my opportunity to introduce these great women and then step aside. So I was thinking I could spend the we could spend the whole time here just introducing these amazing women so i can't list off all of their accomplishments but i hope you will all go and look up these women later and read their impressive biographies honestly all four of these women including our monitor karen kendrick are thoughtful inspiring leaders of people who have navigated their way through a white male leadership dominated environment and carved out their own unique paths. I and all of us have much to learn from them today. So let's start introducing them. First, I want to introduce Amber Hill, who is the Senior Managing Director of Philanthropy for UNICEF USA. Originally, she's from the Bay Area, but Amber now lives in Southern California, where she works closely with UNICEF's uh, chief philanthropy officer overseeing over 150 development professionals. She's worked for two decades in philanthropy. <laughs> she has her MBA. And I think this is really cool. One of her first positions out of college was working for the Beverly Hills Chamber of Commerce, which I think is, I mean, how many people can say that? I had the opportunity to get to know Amber a couple weeks ago. And I have to say, I left that conversation so energized and inspired because she has so much joy in her work. Next, I want to talk about Karen Lamalva, Director of Individual Giving at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Karen has over 25 years of experience leading teams, strategic planning, building relationships. I and our team at Veritas have been working with her for, for a few years now, and our impression of Karen is that she is someone who is absolutely fearless. She's a problem solver and truly authentic. Plus, she's an awesome leader and manager of her team. I also want to introduce Kia Kroom, founder and CEO of Kia Kroom Fundraising and Philanthropy, which is a full-scale Black woman-owned fundraising firm that helps nonprofits serving Black and Brown people raising funds to address the byproducts of structural racism, amongst other things. Kia is a fierce woman, and I know this firsthand, having been on her Black Fundraisers podcast and spending some time with her. She's a single mother who's raising this amazing son who's going to college in the fall, and she's been wildly successful fundraiser for the last two decades. She's a woman of faith and a beacon for justice, and this woman knows good food and drink, and I have to tell you, one of the most creative and entrepreneurial people I know. And finally, I want to introduce Joyce McDonald, president and CEO of Greater Public, an association for hundreds of public media stations across the country. Her role is to develop the vision, the strategic framework, and plans for pub uh, greater public and stations across the network. Joyce has been in public media for decades, having worked for the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and even was once the chief of staff at two NPR's president and C CEO. She has her MS uh, from B BU uh, College of Education. She's worked with ABC Radio, Sony. I mean, she's done it all in the radio business. I've known Joyce now for almost five years, and this is a woman who is absolutely respected by every one of her peers in public media. You cannot walk down the halls of any conference or in the halls of NPR or, or uh, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and Everyone has to stop and talk to Joyce because 
she has been integral to them and their, she has relationships with everyone. I, I got to know Joyce quite well early on in our relationship because we put on a road show together, reaching out to different stations very early on. And what was so funny is that we had the both we had both had the same time timing for meeting together. So we would always say, let's meet for breakfast in the lobby at 7 a.m. And at 6.55, we were both in the same elevator, which I love because that doesn't happen very often. So she has always been a woman on a mission um, and she gets things done. So thank you again for joining us to hear from our guests. Now I want to turn things over to my colleague and another amazing woman, Karen Kendrick, to kick things off. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was a great introduction of everyone. Just a reminder to all of you that we'll be taking your questions in the Q&A box and your comments in the chat box. Jeff will be monitoring those for us. And at the end of this um, time, we'll be having some space for questions of this amazing group of panelists. It's so interesting. We have so much to celebrate today and so much wisdom to share. And I wanna give some context to where we are in our sector with some stats. Um, as we think about these and, and learn from these incredible women. So just let's just take a moment and just let this sink in. So according to GuideStar, at organizations with annual budgets of 2.5 to 5 million, that's the larger, largest percent of nonprofits in our sector, women chief executives make an average of 23% less than men in the same role. Women in nonprofits make 66% of the salaries of their male counterparts. Women make up three quarters of nonprofit employees. However, only 21% of large nonprofit CEOs are women. And just 7.6% of all nonprofits executive staff and 14% of nonprofit boards are women of color. So Joyce, start us out and then Kia, jump in. What do you see as the impact as we think about these pay inequities and lack of representation in our sector? First of all, I don't care if you're a man, a woman, whoever you are, if you don't feel valued, you are not going to achieve your potential. And furthermore, if you don't feel like there's a path for you and you don't see anyone in leadership roles in your organization that look like you, you leave. And I know, uh, in the fundraising field, in many fields, this is this isn't just confined to nonprofits or to fundraising. Um, staff turnover is very expensive. You have to hire new people. You have to train new people. Um, you know, not to mention the the loss of talent, right? And so, what we end up having, and I'll put this in Veritas major giving language, is a leaky pipeline to leadership. Mm. We have people who have aspirations, but, but see no path where they are and don't feel as though they are regarded in any way as qualified or um, you know, going to be looked at to move into leadership positions. Um, so it so it becomes a vicious cycle, right? When you're new in an organization, you may make less than your counterparts, <laughs> right? Some of the pay disparities, it's, it's. Um, I mean, I could go on and on, but but it's one thing that, that I have noticed is that oftentimes males are given raises and promotions based on their potential. Mm. And women tend to be given promotions and raises based on accomplishments. And that has to stop. That's my, that's the tip of the iceberg. Kia, add to that, please. Sure, what I've observed with my own too, and what I'm reading and, and more anecdotally what I'm hearing is women are leaving due to a lot of reasons that, you know, Joyce lifted, right? The fact that they're not 
uh, feeling valued and celebrated, right? The pay disparity being another, and the pay disparity is really just the tip of the iceberg because for me, I've worked in jobs before where I wasn't always earning the wage that I necessarily wanted or needed even at that time. But because there were other intangibles that worked for me, perhaps I had flexibility, right? As, a, as Jeff pointed out, you know, I've been a single parent ever since my son was two weeks old, you know, so there were days when I needed that flexibility when I was caring for my mother who was ill. I needed that flexibility. What's happening is women, especially women of color, are no matter how much they're viewed as a high potential, which I know that we don't really use that language a lot in nonprofits, we tend to hear it more in corporate America, right? You know, that high potential employee that has tremendous potential to be a leader within a company, an operating unit, what have you. What's happening is women are not necessarily, especially women of color being primed and tapped for those kinds of promotional opportunities. Um, we are not seeing a lot of sponsorship of women in this space. And, and I always have to look at it through that lens of color because that's the reality I navigate through life in. Um, and as such, you have this busting out of the seams talent and potential that's not being harnessed that's not being tapped. You might have a woman somewhere who really enjoys her employer. You know, it might've been a dream company to work for. I hear more women say, you know, I always wanted to work here or work there. I jumped at the opportunity. But what happens when you get in the opportunity and you're not being set on a trajectory for growth and promotion? You work for a year or two, especially if you work in fundraising and we know that is fundraisers, what are we averaging now? It used to be 18 months with an organization before you were either sent walking papers or you found greener pastures. I don't know what it is now, but I do know that women are leaving these jobs because that's the only way they're gonna promote, right? That's the only way they're gonna get that VP title if they're that mid-level professional or that executive, that CEO title, if they're already an executive, a VP or chief development officer, for instance. So um, it's resulting in an exodus of, of talent. That's my observation. Thank you, Kia and Joyce. Amber, start us out and you know we'll be talking about all this context as we go along. Talk a little bit about your experience as a leader coming through the sector, and then we'll go to Karen and make sure everybody has a chance to talk about this. So give us some stories, give us some context of, of how you've made this journey. Yeah, you know, um, thank you, Karen, and it's it's so good to be here. Um, you know, Jeff had mentioned um, in the introduction an opportunity I had early in my career working with a business uh, association here in uh, in Los Angeles, and it was a really fascinating opportunity uh, right out of college. And I, I had the opportunity before leaving, um, becoming the director of membership there. Um, but one of the things I, I do remember about the chamber is not so much uh, the actual organization, um, but the, the membership and the businesses and the individuals that I was interacting with. Uh, there strong male presence. I was young uh, and a woman and a woman of color. There weren't a lot of people who looked like me. Uh, and so I just remember being in this environment where there were many times I didn't feel as though I was speaking the same acumen or that I had the same level of confidence that many of the individuals around me had. Um, so I remember that being a defining moment for me, and and I, I already had interest in going back to get my MBA, but felt like there was no better time than the present uh, to go back, get that experience, build my network of being around individuals who were already in this space, um, and then kind of leveraging um, other people's experiences as I was talking to them about going back and why I was doing that, um, I think really helped to set me off um, in a more uh, 
to be a little bit more comfortable in this new environment and setting that I was I was in. So that was just a really defining moment for me as a woman stepping out, a young woman and a woman of color being in an environment that was different than I had uh, experienced prior. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, I um, I took a lot of time to reflect on the purpose of this conversation today, and I and I had a little notebook, and I started to write down all of the women in my life, um, in past jobs that have had such an impact, and just sort of reflect on why they had an impact. They might have been peers, they might have been part of my team, they may have been leaders, they may have been my leader or somebody else's. Um, and I and I think I just have a lot to be grateful for with that respect. Um, I think being a woman in leadership is different for each person based on a variety of factors, including what's important to you personally um, and what's the culture of the organization that you work for. Um, I thought about 22 years ago when I became a mother, um, I knew that I wanted to continue work, have a career. There was no doubt in my mind. And that really meant that there would be some sacrifices along the way, um, as anyone who has a family or, you know, maybe you're a caretaker of elderly parents, or maybe you're a pet mom. Um, all of that has relevance. Um, so on a personal level, I knew I wouldn't be able to attend all of my kids' field trips or all of their sporting events, um, but I wanted to be able to attend some. That was very critically important. Um, so I made sure that I uh, had space to do that with the whatever organization I work with at the time. Um, earlier in my career, uh, when my kids were young, I made the choice not to apply for certain positions because they required overnight travel, um, or it would have required me to uproot my family, uh, move to a different state. That was something that I was not willing to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. um, so we all make different decisions. And I, and I think that we need to acknowledge and respect the decisions that everyone makes. Um, as part of their career. Um, but despite um, the, the decisions that I made, um, I was really motivated to work hard, prove my value, continue my career growth. Um, and that's really what I did. And, and I will say when my kids got older, I did take on a consulting position. I traveled a bunch and I absolutely loved it. Um, and a lot of the women on my list are some of those women I met, met as a consultant. Um, so as women in leadership, I think we really need to identify other women who are just absolute rock star employees. We need to understand what motivates them. Um, if offering them a little bit of flexibility helps us retain that employee, let's do it. Um, you know, people want to, to be seen and feel appreciated. Um, and I think we just need to continue to celebrate and, and lift those people up. Thank you. Jeff's got a question. Yeah. We can't hear you yet. There you go. From this conversation, stemming from this conversation, here's a question. A common complaint at my workplace is that there is an upper limit on potential. Young entry level employees will either hit their ceiling early on or they will stick around for 25 years until they're part of the executive team. There aren't many opportunities for mid level growth, and it makes it feel like achievements aren't rewarded. How can we as employees communicate this to our managers and how can we help? Who wants to jump in? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know that you really need to communicate it to your leaders or your managers. I think that they know. And I think that having been that young entry level professional, um, at one point in time, I think that you, you, you know, do the, you take advantage of the opportunity. And unfortunately, I, I think that it means moving on to greener pastures um, and not being apologetic or abashed about it, right? I'm encouraging women not to feel that guilt about making choices to help them level up in their career because guess what? I don't know very many men who do. You know, I don't know very many men who beat themselves up about that one or two competencies or five that they might not necessarily bring to the job. 
They just rock with it and roll. So um, I don't think that your management needs to be made aware. Um, now, if the question were framed differently, you know, like, what do I do about it? Or how do I, I mean, you max the moment out and, you know, you move on and repot your plant and bloom and continue to bloom elsewhere. And that's the, the that's the way I see it. Here, here. All right. Thank you. So I'm, I'm hearing so far wonder about our pipeline draining out the back, people leaving. I'm hearing about how to be clear on what you want for your life to make a full and balanced life. What, what are your boundaries? And also don't feel guilty about going after what you want and what you need. These are great pieces of wisdom. Um, let's keep going down the path of just a story about your experience as a leader. And we'll go next to Joyce. Yeah, so as uh, Jeff mentioned in the introduction, well, anyone who's worked all the places that he listed, obviously, I am in the the late fall of my my working career. <laughs> so I sort of was that young, hungry person in the 80s, uh, um, sort of middle management in the 90s. And I would say... Um, both the time that has passed since then, and also I think moving into the nonprofit space, um, I feel that there's a healthier environment. There's a long way to go. But I was in boardrooms in the 90s as the only female vice president, you know, at a table of 10. And let me tell you, uh, I don't exactly have a, uh, a a light feminine voice, but boy, it was hard to get heard. Um, you know, I I would literally bang the table. I I developed this very bad habit of like banging the table um, to get people to listen. Um, and uh, you know, I think things are better, but we have a long way to go. Um, and you know, I, I do not discount anyone who's having challenges where they are. Um, and I just really want to, I, I know I said here, here, but I'll say it again to Kia. I've, I have been in places where I could see that I was stuck. And you try, right? You try the ways you know that you can try to advance. And, and if it doesn't work, don't stay and complain. Take control. Go and find your your next opportunity. Um, it's a it's 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 a healthy thing to do, both for you and for the organization you're leaving and the organization you're going to. Kia. Yeah. yeah, I mean, when I think about it all, Karen, I have been really, really blessed and fortunate. This career of mine, I had no idea. I couldn't, I couldn't have even written a better story, right? In terms of how this unfolded, having been, having moved from wanting to work in media, you know, be a um, broadcast personality, if you will, to really parlaying my interest and passion for greater good, right? I have had such a phenomenal time working with organizations across the country that have been doing some remarkable work from what we consider medium-sized organizations to large to what I call growing organizations. We don't call them small, call them growing right, in the interest of assets framing, and I just sit back sometimes, and I'm like, yeah, I was a part of that, yeah, I got to be a part of that, yeah, I raised the money, you know, and it's not so much about the capital, the resources that I raised to benefit people and lives, like, I've seen people's lives literally be changed, you know, I've seen people who were staring death in the face, you know, from people that might have had full blown AIDS and been living on the street that got into housing, 
And I some of some of which I was able to visit a few weeks ago, and they're like, Kia, I never forgot you and what you did, you know, to help me. You know, it has been remarkable. And I would say to anybody, well, the jobs that we work don't, I don't think there is a perfect you know, job anywhere. I mean, hell, I work for myself and it's pretty close, you know, sister's enjoying it, but nothing is without some degree of, of um, you know, a challenge, right? They say anything worth, I get mixed up sometimes, you know, anything worth having, you you gotta, you'd work for it and fight for it to some degree, right? But what I wanna say to you all and everyone listening, is I feel as though I'm really living out my God-given purpose and talent. And it has been remarkable. It has been so enriching. So the challenges and experiences that I've had, the bumps and bruises along the way, I just consider them par for the course, you know? And I would just encourage the people that are on the line and even the women that I'm sitting beside in these Zoom windows, you know, to really look at like how much of what you're doing really brings you joy, mm -hmm. right? Aside from our salaries and pay, what is really bringing you joy and filling your cup? Because I tell you, my cup runneth over as I'm sitting here in company with you all. Thank you. So we've heard, you know, don't stay and complain, work it, try to see if there's opportunities. If not, jump if you need to. We've heard, be clear about what you need and what you want. I'd love to hear more around how you've, how you see you've developed through your career. Like what's been beneficial? Maybe you had a block come up and you figured out how to get around it that would help someone else. Maybe it was a certain way in which you maneuvered through organizations, the way you spoke up, whatever that might be. What helped you in your development through the years as leaders? And we'll start with Karen and go to, um, Amber, and then we'll kind of go around. I'd love to hear that from everyone, actually. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think a lot of self-reflection on the different experiences that, that I've had and uh, commitment and continued learning um, along the way. So, you know, getting a better understanding of myself and the work that I really enjoy and excel at, um, reflecting on what's important to me personally and professionally. I kind of covered that already. Um, it, identifying my own strengths and weaknesses and communicating them to others. I have said a number of times, once I realized it to managers, when I've started new positions, I, I've said to them, and I, Karen, I've probably said this to you, I don't read between the lines. Please be very direct with me. I appreciate it. You're not going to hurt my feelings. Just, just tell it to me straight. Um, Learning how to communicate based on the audience, you're going to communicate differently up versus across or down in the organization. Um, and understanding what makes each person unique, identifying their superpowers, but acknowledging that those superpowers might change and not to like pigeonhole somebody into what they're good at because they may blossom um, and build other skills. Um, and I think, you know, most importantly, learning to be brave, having difficult conversations in a very thoughtful and intentional way to set up a team member for success. Sometimes it's not always been the easiest thing for me to give constructive feedback for fear of hurting someone's feelings. Um, but I've, I've really found a way to do that just in a really kind way. And I, and I look at it as helpful to that person and helping them grow. Any tidbits about communicating up this way and this way that you want to share? I mean, communicating up, it really needs to be succinct, you know, bullet points uh, get to get your, your information across. Um, communicating down and, and even across, well, let's say communicating down. If you're a leader, um, sometimes leaders above you may be hard on you. But filter that. That doesn't mean you need to be hard on the people below you. You need to motivate them. Um, and I would say communicating across, stay away from the gossip. Just focus on the job. Um, be kind to each other and support each other. Um, I don't know if that's helpful, Karen, but that's yeah. my initial gut reaction. I love that. Thank you, Amber. 
Yeah, you know, I would say, you know, what's carried me through, I always try to ground myself and like, you know, two to three key things, like what is it that I need out of this <laughs> uh, or what I want to see or receive out of this from a professional standpoint, but then also like personally, right? So there have been times where I haven't felt supported, um, you know, whether it's from an organization more broadly, whether it's within uh, teams in terms of my leadership, whether it's from external constituents, uh, there have been times, but do I need everyone at all times to support me? No, <laughs> uh, I could still thrive um, and, and achieve and get what I want accomplished for the goals that I've set out for myself. And so I think it's, you know, for me, it's been, you know, I'd identify what that support system is and what that looks like, because there have been champions all throughout um, and really leaning into that. Um, you know, when there have been times uh, in terms of my leadership where if I feel like I'm not getting what I want to receive, you know, there are other places to seek that out. Uh, I can, you know, uh, I can develop that in my extracurricular and still be a leader uh, until that opportunity or time professionally opens up and I can lead more in that way. Um, so it's just a matter, you know, always, I think having a plan of action and really being strategic, if you're not getting it here or you can't showcase it here, you can't demonstrate, you can't model, you can't lead, you're not receiving it, then where else can I, uh, receive or demonstrate or lead in that way? Um, so I think it's just really taking like a broad perspective, but then having the plan as it makes sense uh, for you. I love that. It's like flowing water around each obstacle, mm -hmm. getting your needs met, figuring it all mm -hmm. out. That's beautiful. Jeff's got some questions. Why don't you pop on with a question or two, Jeff, and then we'll come back to that topic. Okay. Here's a question. I can't hear you yet, Jeff. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. There must be like a little delay. So what do you think are defining characteristics of a great leader? And is there something specific to being a woman leader? All right, let's let's start with you, Joyce, and then go to Amber next. I think that a I think that a great leader, and this is not specific to women, um, is consistently, like a hundred percent of the time, is respectful and kind to everybody in the organization and everybody that that organization works with. Um, you know, you can, you can present the most beautiful vision of a shining thing on the hill, but if you never connect with people, if you never show people that you see them and appreciate them, you're traveling alone. And you know, again, having come up through corporate America in the 80s and 90s, um, the men had a lot to learn from the women <laughs> in that respect. Thank you, Joyce. Amber. You know, I really, um, I think a, a great leader, a great characteristic is about being authentic. Um, however that is for you, um, I think that's just critically uh, important. Um, and so like, even in myself, sometimes, you know, I've, uh, I feel like I'm authentic, but I look and hope for environments to become, uh, even more nurturing for, uh, you know, people to come with their authentic selves, um, and not be apologetic for it. Um, and I think as a leader too, being able to be, I think being candid, um, I think it's important uh, if you want to get a message through, if you really want to build a connection. I think sometimes in the workplace, from my uh, experiences, you know, I think people uh, get into uh, a culture of saying what you think people want to hear <laughs> uh, and doing oh, it over, yeah. and over again until like you just don't even know where is the authentic self, where is the true intention. 
And yeah. so I really, I really think it's important for all of us to be authentic. It's, and you know, you can get caught up in a lot of things, but if we can ground ourselves in that, I think that makes a, a really wonderful leader. And what would an environment look like, Amber, that celebrates and, and embraces people's authenticity to you? Hmm. Mm-hmm. I think, um, I think it's an environment where, you know, um, we can acknowledge uh, our differences, acknowledge that um, people communicate in different ways, uh, with different styles, um, and just having like an acknowledgement and an acceptance of that, um, you know, realizing like the, there's this um, book I don't that I just I'm I'm reading and I'm reading again uh, called Quiet and it talks about the New York bestseller and it talks about like introverts and extroverts. Mm -hmm. um, it's really really excellent because when you're 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 reading it and it's like you know um, you don't always have to be the loudest. <laughs> the first to speak, the this, the that, you really don't need to be all that. Um, but if you're intentional and you're thoughtful and you're authentic, um, it just nurtures an environment where people feel comfortable um, to be able to speak, not feel judged. You know, it, it, that's the kind of culture I think would nurture that kind of authenticity. Oh, I'm getting chills. <laughs> I love that. I would love to add to what you said, Amber, I think it's our role as leaders to celebrate the quiet ones in the room. It can't, like you said, you don't always have to be the first to speak. You don't always have to be the loudest, but oftentimes people are elbowing their way in because that's who gets the attention. Um, so I think as leaders, it's really important to be thoughtful and acknowledge everyone in the room who has something to say and know that some people won't have an immediate reaction. They think they have to process and they're gonna come back with some really great stuff. Anything you wanna add, Kia? Sure, so I'm hearing kind, which, you know, I really support that, Joyce. I don't care if you the person picking up trash in front of the building to the person at the, in the penthouse, you know, being kind, I'm hearing authentic, and I'm hearing inclusive, Karen, what you're describing is inclusion, you know, making sure that those quieter or uh, more introverted voices and views are heard and felt. What I would add is a leader takes care of their people. An effective and good leader takes care of their people. And I had to learn this, right? I went on a journey to learn. So just had a couple of, there was a movie called Horrible Bosses once, you know, a sister this, this had some, some experiences. And, and I, I really went on a journey to learn, you know, who, what type of leader did I want to be, right? As a result of some of the harrowing experiences that I've had, right, along the way. And I found that that's what leadership is about, is taking care of your people, right? Supporting and, and challenging and even, and even disciplining, you know, as appropriate, right? Taking care of your people so that they take care of the end users, right? And that was what I discovered. And what I researched demonstrated that there were a couple of leaders that I examined and their leadership style and their acumen and how they were able to turn companies around by really leaning in and being a human being and um, changing the culture to be one that it encourages authenticity, right? And, and inclusion and just care and concern for your fellow man and the result of that was the employees felt as though they were really a part of something greater and worked their patooties off, you know, to make it work. So, you know, there was record productivity. So I had to kind of really rethink that whole leader, you know, the, the, my definition of it. And that's the conclusion I've come to. The good leader takes care of their people. 
so that they can take care of the end users. There's a question in the chat, if I may, can I quickly respond? Yep, Somebody says, are there any others that are mixed that have a hard time with the authentic part or bringing themselves to the table? I find myself code switching. I saw your comment and I wanted to speak to that because I've been guilty of that, right? I code switched, switched codes. And can you, you know, explain what my, that means to folks that don't know what that oh, means? Oh, absolutely. So for those that are not familiar with code switching, code switching is something that people do to, I want to say assimilate or um, establish a shared, um, you know, fit in with the dominant culture, right? Which is, which is assimilating. It's a very appropriate word. It's a word that people, it's, it describes people who, you know, you might, um, it's, it's what my mother would do and what I would do, you know, when my mother would answer the phone, hi, this is Patty, how can I help you? You know, she put on her super, super, uber proper voice. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that, right? But when you're changing who you are and how you speak and how you inherently dress, like I did a podcast episode with a good Judy friend, girlfriend of mine, and we talked about how both of us have these kind of Southern accents. And interestingly, before we even met, one another, both of us had considered going to a finishing school to try to unlearn or a linguist to address that accent. You know what? I like my accent. <laughs> I like my accent, right? I like my urban country, Southern draw, right? And if, and at some point in time, I decided that I just wasn't going to do it anymore, right? I decided that I wanted to be bald headed and wear blonde hair, a bald blonde buzz cut. And I decided I wanted to stop wearing St. John clothing to work and start wearing more colors. Why? Because I've been socialized to wear pinstripes and blue suits and black suits and white um, dress shirts to demonstrate how professional I am, right? in assimilating. Um, and what I want to say to the person who posed this question is, if you're finding yourself doing that, I would ask myself, not the why, but how long are you going to do this, right? And I would ask myself, at what cost are you doing it? Because you're looking at a person who did that to my detriment. Right. And I ended up dealing with some depression and having to make some really difficult decisions for myself. And I decided, you know what, the buck stops here. I like myself. I like what I bring to the table. And if I can't bring that in a particular environment, then that environment will have to operate without me. And I'm going to go where I can bring those pieces of myself that are very much who I am. You know, and I find that what I bring, and I would argue that what you bring, there's only one you, there's only one person that's going to do that. And we do ourselves a disservice when we are in environments where we code switch and, and take on the um, language and the behaviors of a dominant culture, because look at what unbridled creativity is being thwarted as a result of you trying to fit in when you weren't necessarily meant to do that. And that's my comment to you. Thank you, Kia. Awesome. Jeff, do you have any other burning questions? Yeah, so there's a couple of folks that want some practical advice from you all. The first question is, what kind of steps would you suggest a mid-level leader or someone who feels stuck should take for the, before they evaluate leaving an organization? So you, you've you said, hey, if you're not fitting there and you've tried everything, go, go somewhere else. But what are some of the th steps you would take before you do that? Who wants to jump in? Joyce. So I would say um, if you have a great relationship with your boss, have a conversation with them and say, look, I, you know, I would like to advance here. And, you know, I, I'm 
relying on you to, to help me do that. And can you help me think of some ways that I can get more visible assignments, et cetera? If you cannot have that conversation with your boss, that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you, by the way. Um, is there someone else in a leadership position in your organization that that you know you're you're friendly with, meaning they say hello in the hallways, you've worked on a project or two together that you can have that conversation with and kind of say, what are you seeing? You know, how are you seeing me in this in this organization? Um, and how did you get where you are? And what advice do you have for me? Um, you know, I think sometimes people are afraid of kind of stepping out and making it known that they would like to take on more. Um, and I think once, you, once you've kind of said that out loud, interesting things can happen. So that's definitely one route that I would take. That's awesome. This, um, this next question is sort of similar, but I, I think it's worth um, giving her some advice. So I'm at a nonprofit where I love the mission and the work we're doing. The only thing that is missing for me is the opportunity to lead. I'm great at my job and leading teams. How does one move from being an MGO to be able to lead in some capacity within the organization? Or how would you approach these conversations with a supervisor or executive? Amber, start that one. I know you've done this yourself. <laughs> um, you know, I would say, you know, speaking with someone within the organization, if there's another leader that you trust, another another manager, and it, and it doesn't necessarily need to be someone within your fundraising track. If there is another leader in the organization in a different department or different division, um, you know, that individual individual could probably provide you with some uh, some tidbits, some ways that they've maybe navigated. Maybe it's someone who's been with the organization for a long time, has history, has perspective on how things have been done or changed, or, you know, that might be another good individual just to kind of seek their, their feedback. Um, you know, I will say there was a, a period of time um, where I was making a, a transition and I actually sought out um, recruiters um, to say, you know, I was thinking, am I going to leave the nonprofit space and go to the corporate side in terms of corporate social responsibility? Or do I want to stay in the fundraising? And if I stay in fundraising, what is it that I need uh, to continue to grow? And I remember several recruiters and just coffee conversations that I that I had, it was like, if you want to continue at some point to be an executive director, uh, chief fundraising officer, you need to be a very major gifts officer. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, so then it took me on this route where I was like major gift fundraising opportunities, but then what is it within an organization that I'm looking for that I need in order to be in that role? So that was as I was coming in to be a major gifts officer, but you can use those similar steps uh, or perspective in looking to grow either within your organization um, or maybe looking above and uh, beyond. Thank you. I, I think we forget that there's so much, we build the relationships upward too, and go have those conversations and say, this is what I love to do. This is what I'm interested in. Where do you see possibilities? Where do you see me and being a good fit? Um, what ideas do you have and use them as mentors and idea makers, and then they have you in their mind as possibilities. And so it's making those connections and reaching out regularly, like, like you would do a donor. <laughs> And continue, you know, keeping those warm, keeping those real, and you know, bringing those to folks around you. Those are great, great ideas. All right, we are we are moving through these questions. Um, what advice would you give a leader who really is interested in an organization who's really interested in developing women? We've talked a lot about place for authenticity. We've talked a lot about. Um, opportunities for growth, what would you what would you advise them to do? What should they be doing now? And we'll start with you, Karen. That's a really tough question. Um, and I think we've covered so much. Um, I, I think we need to be intentional as women leaders in identifying other women, um, understanding where we were raised or how we've been raised or how we've been 
coached to react to certain situations that may be very different from men. So identify those women, offer some um, guidance, um, some confidence boosts, um, encouragement to use your voices. And when somebody does use their voice, appreciate it. Um, I, I remember walking into a room with a vice president of fundraising who asked the team for their opinion on something. And when they gave their opinion, this individual told them how wrong they were. Hmm. That stifled future future voices. Um, so so just be understanding and being be open um, and encouraging to people to use their voices. Thank you. Jeff's got a burning question. He keeps texting me with all these questions he wants to ask. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? You're still muted, Jeff. Can you hear me now? You got me? There you go. Okay. <laughs> I thought this was a great question to kind of end the discussion that all of you could answer. And what are the top two dreams or desires that you have that you would love to see happen in order to better support women in this field? Top, say it one more time. I know what we have some introverts top, here who want to think what about What are the women. top two dreams or desires you have that would you would love to see happen in order to better support women in this field? Ah, perfect question. I, I'm happy to jump in here. I want to see women get paid equitably. Um, you know, we're all feeling the effects of inflation. You know, it's not gender discriminative. So I want to see women getting paid you know, cash in hand, right? And I also want to see more deliberate sponsorship. And I don't wanna take for granted that everybody understands what I say when I say sponsorship. What I say, what I'm saying when I say sponsorship really pertains more to you know, elevating a name to the, the top of the list, right? A mentor is one thing, you know, I want to see more women um, mentored, but I want to see more women sponsored. It's like I told Jeff, um, you know, a couple of months ago, I said, sponsorship makes the difference when my name or another woman's name is on a list or comes up in the room. Sponsorship is what gets that email sent to me or that call like, hey, I had this great opportunity because this individual, you know, like Jeff has sponsored and elevated my name for things. And I'm always grateful for that. So more pay, more money, coins, and more sponsorship. That's what I want to see for women in this field. Who's ready next? Joyce. I'll, I'll go. Um... If I had a, like a real magic, magic wand, right? And I would first endorse the things that Kia said. So I get four altogether. Um, I would like a new understanding among boards and leaders of what power looks like. There's a lot of baggage um and maybe maybe the maybe the the uh releasing those stereotypes um is is slowly happening over time but i want it gone now i think you know the there's a big difference between um power and aggression or overconfidence or um some of some of the negative associations with leadership and we got to get rid of those because they don't work <laughs> mm -hmm. um so that's that's my contribution thank you joyce amber you know, I say one, you know, A, making a space for women to be leaders um, through exposure and, you know, of opportunity. Uh, but then, you know, also women of color 
um, so that you can see yourself, see others um, in roles uh, where you would like to excel into or elevate into. I think that is critical into the space, especially in uh, the fundraising space. I just think that is it's it's key um, making that space and then more of a more of a um, systemic way of creating kind of that that model opportunity or kind of the um, uh, the opportunity for there to be more women leaders and women of color in these um, opportunities and positions. Right now, there's a lot of you know. Uh, stepping into the mentorship role. <laughs> so it's like a very individual, um, you know, thing to step into a, a commitment, but like an organizational institutional commitment in that regard um, to elevate more women into leadership roles. I would love to see that. So what, what do you see organizations do that are committing to put women in those roles? Um, I mean, you know, I, I, you know, here as an example here at UNICEF USA, I mean, we have our first ever, and I've been here with the organization for a long time, um, you know, African American uh, chief philanthropy officer. Um, and, you know, for a very large organization uh, like ours or just even in the industry, uh, you don't see that often. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it takes um, that step um, to then help to elevate um, others into the roles um, and just to provide the platform um, and to change the culture, to change the conversation, to change the narrative of the industry as a whole. Thank you. Karen. Um, I think Karen knows how much I like to reflect on things and think through them and process them. But, um, you know, I just reflect on the words kind and respectful. Um, and the more we let people be their authentic selves, the better our organizations are going to be because people are going to throw out ideas without fear um, of, of someone making them feel terrible about that idea. Um, we build and we build and we build and we build on, on those ideas. We need to have that safe space and we as leaders can create that um, space for our teams. If you are not getting authenticity and crazy ideas, you might want to think about how you are as a leader um, mm -hmm. and how you're treating your teams. Thank you. Wow. What's, what's sitting with me as I'm thinking about everyone listening is I hope you walk away today knowing that you, who you are authentically, how you lead with kindness, how you're thoughtful in working and communicating with others, is your strength. And I hope you can look at, hear these incredible leaders and all that they, you don't even know all they've done in their lives, which is incredible, but they've come from, as you can see and hearing them speak, a space of truly being themselves and being truly human. Uh, it's not a leadership that was about power and control and manipulation or any of those things Joyce was talking about. So that actually wins. <laughs> know that bringing your whole self wins and don't give up finding those spaces that allow you to grow and develop and continue to move and flow through your careers and experiences. And remember, like Karen said, be clear about what's healthy for you and good for you, what your boundaries are, what's going to work for you. And don't feel guilty about that. As Kia said, be unapologetic um, and step into those spaces because um, we need you. We need you out there doing that. So thank you so much, everyone, for this incredible conversation. Thank you, Jeff, for your help as well and your great introduction. Thank you all for all your great comments and questions. And I can't wait to even listen to this again. There is so much wisdom. I appreciate it. And let's, this, what a way to celebrate International Women's Day. Thank you, everyone.